Hi, we're going to talk about fractals today. Fractals, what is a fractal? OK, let's, for a moment, um, think, about the, think about back in time, some time in your life where you were sitting at a t chair with a little desk in front of it, and you were studying geometry, middle school, high school, last week, who knows? You were learning about circles, and polygons, and rectangles, and lines, and the relationships between angles, and triangles, and sides of shapes, all this stuff. Very important, very interesting. But now let's think about and let's, so let's think about those shapes that you learned in geometry and, and how they might describe things we find in our world. Okay, so over here, I have the top of a cup of tea, and maybe you would say to yourself, that looks. I mean, you can't really see. Look, it disappears with the white, but I can put it right here. It looks just like a circle. And over here, I have this eraser, and if I look at this eraser, it's rectangular. So to some extent. These idealized forms, these Euclidean sh ge geometrical shapes, can describe the world we live in. I'm staring at this camera. It's also very circular and rectangular. But think about nature. And I have this, <laughs> I don't know if this is going to work. But think about nature. Look at these clouds. And I don't know, look at these crazy coastlines and these, uh, this seashell thing and the waves of the water. And look at these trees. And look at the lightning and all this stuff. And this man is talking about fractals. <laughs> This is, by the way, is from PBS, Hunting the Hidden Dimension. I highly recommend you watch that if you want to kind of dive deeper into fractal stuff. Think about all that stuff. <laughs> that worked perfectly, just the way I imagined. These are not shapes that we can describe with Eucl idealized Euclidean forms. We can't describe a lightning bolt. I mean, maybe it's like a series of connected lines, but the overall quality of the shape, mountains, coastlines, lightning bolts, these are things we need a new type of geometry to describe. And it's not so new, but it was new in 1975. Not actually, it wasn't really new in 1975. You see, fractals have been around for a very, very long time. But the term fractal came about in 1975 <laughs> with the publication of this book. I mean, you know, condensing history there, I'm sure there was, the term came before the book. But um, the Fractal Geometry of Nature by Benoit Mandelbrot who coined the term fractal. And I'm sure many of you have seen the Mandelbrot set, which is a very, very famous fractal um, shape. I don't have a prepared image to show you. But um, so what well, I'm talking in circles here. What we want to do today is look at what is this thing called a fractal that describes somehow the, these shapes that appear in nature. And if we could understand what a fractal is, then could we write code to implement algorithms behind uh, that would generate fractal patterns. That's what we're going to do today. It's very exciting. So, um, well, let's think. So, let's. I want to define the term fractal a little bit more formally, perhaps. So, a fractal is a shape that, when broken into parts, right? Fractal from the Latin fractus, meaning broken. A shape that, when broken into parts, the parts look like a copy of the whole shape. Now, what does that mean exactly? So a very common scenario, which we'll actually make a processing example that implements in a later video, is a tree. So let's say I draw a line here, and then I connect that line with two other lines. And each of those two lines, I connect with two other lines. And each of those two lines, I connect with other two other lines. I'm making all these lines a little bit shorter every time I do it. And I could sit here all day, and I would be a very happy person, actually. Just, But I think I'm taking up too much time in this video, so I'll stop. But you can see here, even though I barely scratched the surface of how many times I can keep connecting these lines, if I grab this particular branch, and bring it down here and kind of rotate it so it faces up, what do I have here? I have this shape, which is essentially the same as the bigger shape we started with. This is the concept of self-similarity, very the sort of key quality of fractals. Fractals are self-similar, meaning the parts of the shape look like the whole shape. And here we have an exact copy of the whole shape inside the part, which is an important distinction. This is a sort of exact fractal. Um, one thing I should point out, though, that self-similarity isn't just enough to make a fractal. There is a self-similar shape. If I take a part of that shape, this little line segment, and zoom in on it, it looks like the original line. But this shape doesn't have, I would say, which is a, a sort of important thing, a kind of fine structure at small scales. So this is an important principle of fractals, that self-similarity isn't just enough. But I, I want to return back to this idea that this was an exact fractal. Let's take another scenario. Now, this isn't a shape in nature exactly, but let me, let me, let me um, pose this scenario. 
Okay, I'm going to draw for you because I have this. I, I, I was, I've been checking the stock market a lot recently, not at all. But um, let's say we pick a company, Apple, and we're going to draw the price of Apple stock. This is what's been happening to Apple stock. Maybe it's been going down recently. There we go. This is a graph of Apple stock. Now, let me ask the question, over what time, pe well, over what time period have I graphed here? Is this a week, a month, 10 years, a day, a minute, a second? You know, trades happen very quickly. We don't know the answer to that because, let's just say for a second, I said this was one year. What if I were to go and grab this section, which is maybe, let's say, one month, and zoom in on it? Maybe we might have something that looks like this. The parts at, at any level of zoom, the shape has the same quality to it. Now this, though, is not exact, right? The pattern that's zoomed in on this part of this time period of the Apple stock is not the exact, the one, one month shape is not exactly one year, but it has the same quality. And this is often referred to as a stochastic fractal. And the, the quality of the shape is kind of has a, a random or probability probability component to it. So this is an important distinction as we look at different algorithms for generating fractals and making things look natural, to what extent do we want kind of exact copies or copies that approximate the whole with some kind of range of probability. So um, OK, so these are, the, these are two, uh, two important dis um, aspects of a fractal. But the key thing, the key element that I have not mentioned, which will lead us to this path of making all these processing examples that are going to be wonderful is the concept of recursion. Fractals have, are generated from a recursive definition. Now, the idea of recursion is a beautiful and elegant thing. <laughs> when we implement it, it makes our code so short and it's so elegant looking and it creates this beautiful pattern, but it's a weird thing and it's a thing that doesn't immediately make sense to us. And I want to look uh, first at a kind of just pure mathematical scenario where a mathematical concept is defined through recursion. Recursion means a, f a function, a recursive function is a function that uses itself in its own definition. It's, it's like saying, hi, it's like very warm under these lights. And people ask, well, what does it mean for it to be warm? And I say, oh, the definition of warm is the feeling you have when you feel warm. <laughs> That's probably a terrible example for all sorts of linguistic reasons. But I'm using the term warm in my definition of the, of the term warm, warm, which seems like a crazy thing that you shouldn't be able to do. But in math, and in programming, this is actually something you, you should be doing. It's wonderful. <laughs> OK, so what, let's look at the classic scenario is factorial. And I think we're going to look at this. We're going to end this video and start to look at recursion in code next. OK, so let's look at um, factorial. So uh, if you don't remember what factorial is, let's just say for a moment, right? 5 factorial. 5 factorial equals 5 times 4 times 3 times 2 times 1. We multiply the number 5 times every number that, come, that, is, that, that is less than 5 all the way down to 1. Right? OK, so now let's look at what 4 factorial is. 4 times 3 times 2 times 1. Oh, interesting. Look, this is the same as this, right? Those match. So I could actually say 5 factorial equals 5 times 4 factorial. Interesting. Which actually means I could say the factorial of any number n equals n times the number n minus 1 factorial. Look at this. This is, it's crazy. This is the definition of factorial. The definition of factorial is n factorial equals the number n times n minus 1 factorial. Have we really said what factorial is here? I mean, it looks kind of like we have it. But we have, actually. Because if we play this out more, then we're saying, ah, well, you know what this really means? 5 factorial equals 5 times 4 times 3 factorial, which means 5 factorial is 5 times 4 times 3 times 2 factorial, which is 5 times 4 times 3 times 2 times 1 factorial. And actually, we need to add something to this definition. 1 factorial equals 1. And in a way, this is our exit condition. Now. I mean exit condition. I'm using the term exit condition because we're about to program this stuff. And one of the things we're going to see with a recursive definition is it's something like a loop. Right? You could imagine, write the code. This is your exercise. Write the code 
to define the function factorial. Int factorial int n. Oh, and kind of ran out of space there. You need to return the answer. Well, you could probably do this fairly easily with a loop, a for loop, right? What if, I mean, 5 times 4 times 3 times 2 times 1, any, you know, i equals 5, i is greater than um, 0, i minus minus, the result equals uh, the result times i, right? You could imagine some loop where you say 5 times 5 minus 1 times 5 minus 2 times 5 minus 3, right? You have this loop that's doing that. Try to do it with recursion. A loop has an exit condition. When i gets down to 1, stop looping. The recursive definition where factorial is defined according to itself, right, you call itself, which calls itself, which calls itself, which calls itself, that has to stop at some point. Not in theoretical fantasy land where we make fractals that go on for infinity, which is an important question, but in real life programming world where we have discrete finite things, we have to have an exit condition. So this is what this is the principle by which we are going to generate fractal patterns. Instead of thinking in terms of numbers, which is probably a, you know somebody would probably tell me I can't believe you started without visual imagery and people need to learn visually. So I don't know, but um, this is a nice scenario with numbers. We're going to look what does it mean when we have a function which draws something which is defined according to drawing something. So that's what we're going to do in the next video. I had to open the window, it's very hot. I don't know if you hear the sounds of the street. But, um, um, but before we get to that video, try uh, doing this, try writing the code for factorial and see how far you get. And obviously, uh, there's an answer in the repository, and I'll uh, link to that below as well. Okay.